everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm taking your questions on torque specs, trunk issues, timing chains, and more. This is episode 182 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, in order to get a question on a show like this, be sure to email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Put question for Charles in the subject, ask your question right at the top, hit that enter button a couple of times for me, and then give me the details. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this one, be sure to check the quick videos playlist on YouTube, where I simply answer one question per video, much shorter, generally with my iPhone. And hey guys, if you want a way to help support me, support the show as well, and more importantly, get discounts for yourself to places like Black Forest Industries, Eurowise, and Sonic Tools, be sure to check out the crew membership program. This is a premium membership where you get discounts to all those places and more, as well as VW Audi training guides and exclusive videos from me. So hey, do me a favor, check that out. The link is in the description. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, with all that wrapped up, let's get into the questions. First one comes from Al. What are your thoughts on torque specs? I completely believe in what I consider to be important torque specs, head bolts, timing chain procedures, stretch bolts, etc. But what about general day-to-day -day stuff and repairs? Talking about suspension components, axle nuts, wheel nuts, gearbox bolts, and everything that could be considered everyday stuff. For years and years, I've just tightened them by hand or with an impact and never had any problems at all. I know some people are really particular about them and are labeled the torque police. I know there's factory specs for a technical reason, but is it really that bad? Um, the torque police, that's funny. So, Al, great question. Uh, this is a gray area, right? There's the textbook perfect world answer and that's everything needs to be torqued properly every single time every bolt that says must replace after use needs to be replaced every single time i promise you in the professional world and in the diy world that doesn't happen every time in fact it probably happens less often than replacing everything exactly the way the book says and remember it's not just about how tight a bolt is there's more to tightening procedure than just that. Sometimes it's walking two bolts in, you know, together, one at a time, tighten it a little bit, tighten it a little bit, tighten it a little bit, tighten it a little bit. Then there's the bolts that are coated, and you're not supposed to use impact guns at all to tighten the bolts, like VW, uh, newer VW subframe bolts. They're coated. You're not supposed to use an impact. So it's not just, I'm tightening this to the proper click, click with my torque wrench. There's more to it than that. In the perfect world, yes, everything should be torqued and replaced as per the manual because like Al said, there are these specs and these procedures for a reason. What do we do in the real world? We use our best judgment. Things like head bolts and water pump bolts generally, um, that stuff gets replaced every time. But what about suspension component bolts? Do those get replaced every time? No. Do those get torqued every time? No. Should they? Well, maybe. Let's evaluate what happens when you torque a bolt properly using the whole procedure. Is the car on the ground with the suspension loaded? Is it unloaded? You know, there, again, more to it than just tightening the bolt. We have tightened that bolt following the procedure properly the way the entire suspension was meant to be tightened. Loaded, unloaded, whatever. When we just simply go brap, brap, brap in and run a bolt in, we're not really tightening it in the way that it was intended to. So while, you know, it may not have a problem today, it may not have a problem a year from now, what about three years from now when maybe that suspension component is worn out because it was just so ever slightly in a bind? And that's something that a lot of times as technicians we don't think about and we don't find out about because by the time that happens, maybe they're onto the second owner or that customer has moved away or they forgot, oh yeah, three years ago I had this one link replaced and now this link is bad again. So while I will be the first to admit that I do not follow the torque spec, torque sequence, torque procedure every single time, it is important. And I have in my later career 
started realizing the level of importance of that and actually backing up and taking my time to torque the bolts properly. Now, there's the other side of this too, right? There's like a million sides to this. The other side is I don't torque drain plugs on oil pans. I got a really good feel for this and how much torque I need to apply to a drain plug to make it tight, not over tight, not under tight, and to crush the crush washer properly because I've done this with a drain plug what feels like a billion times. So do I put a torque wrench on that? Nope. Do I think you should? Not a bad idea. You know, I got the feel for it. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. When I use a certain ratchet, uh, I know what about 10 newton meters feels like, and I get really close almost every single time. Sometimes I'll go back and put my torque wrench on it just to make sure that my old uh, twist calibrator is, uh, is not off. So um, I feel like this is almost a loaded question, like there's a no-win answer because if I say yes, torque everything properly every single time, I'm a hypocrite because I don't do that. If I say, eh, don't worry about it, you'll be fine on the everyday day-to-day -day stuff, well, I'm also not right either. So you have to use your best judgment as a professional. You have to err on the side of doing it properly versus not doing it properly. But again, like I mentioned, I'm the first one to tell you I am not a torque Nazi about a lot of things. The things I am a torque Nazi about are things like spark plugs because I've seen the repercussions of not doing that properly. So um, officially, torque it properly. Unofficially and in the real world, you use your best judgment, err on the side of doing it the right way. And remember that just because you don't see a problem with it the second you finish the job doesn't mean there might not be a long-term problem that you're gonna see year two, three down the road. All right, next one comes from Larry. My Jetta trunk closes just fine, but won't open electrically. When I open it from the inside and the trunk is completely open, the electrical switch will operate fine. I close the trunk and it does nothing. What is wrong? Larry, great question. So this is um, an unknown year Jetta, <laughs> but it probably doesn't matter. So a couple of really common things with Volkswagen trunk latches, right? From probably Mark IV, and forward. I haven't seen this on the Mark VI so much, but it's always possible. Two big issues. One, trunk wiring harnesses. Remember, every time the trunk opens and closes, opens and closes, that wiring harness is getting stretched or twisted or tweaked, and that can cause breakage in the wires. It's pretty, pretty common. The other thing, latches can fail, and sometimes they fail in kind of a weird way. Um, usually when they fail, though, they don't just work when the trunk is open and not when the trunk is shut. The other really common thing I've seen is corrosion in the connector for the latch. So water will get in, it'll sit in that connector, and it'll ever so slightly corrode the contacts either in the latch or in the connector that plugs into the latch. If you disconnect the latch, you don't always see the corrosion because the holes are teeny, teeny, tiny. Look inside the latch itself for the corrosion. You'll probably see it there more pronounced than you will in the connector. And the best repair for that is, you know, you could try and clean it out with some electrical cleaner. That works okay. Uh, I usually recommend repinning that connector and replacing the latch, especially if it's wonky. You don't want to be driving down the road and your uh, trunk latch connector make contact and your trunk pop open. So I would check those two things. You can also latch it with the trunk open and see what it does, see if it works that way. But it sounds like you probably have a wiring harness issue inside the hinge or at the connector for the latch itself. And if there's anything else in the trunk that doesn't work, like maybe the tag lights, turn them on and open and close the trunk and see if you see a point where either the lights come on or they go off. And that'll be the point where you want to inspect the harness to see what is in a bind, what's kinked or what's twisted. All right, next one comes from Joe. I own a 2010 Passat with a TSI engine, it has about 68K on it. I've learned from your videos that there's a problem with the timing chain tensioner. I have contacted several dealers about this issue and received different advice about the timing chain tensioner. Some have told me that there's only an issue with the tensioner if the engine has low oil pressure. Others told me I should change both the chain and the tensioner at 80K. I contacted an independent VW tech and they said only timing chain tensioner should be replaced. I'm confused about the issue and not sure what the correct action is to take. I've experienced numerous issues with the car, including intake manifold, injectors, coil pack, air conditioning, and turbocharger. I've had all these items replaced either under my extended or VW recalls. My car runs great now and I'm planning to drive it for at least a few more years. 
I don't mind spending the money to maintain it, but I don't want to waste money replacing items that don't need to be replaced. Assuming I have the old timing chain tensioner on my car, what is your advice on when and what parts should I replace on my Passat? I'm also disappointed in VW not giving any guidance on the issue, especially since failure of the chain tensioner could cause catastrophic damage. Why doesn't VW have a recall on the part that could cause this kind of damage? On engines that have timing belts, there is a more specified interval on when to change the belt. However, in this case, VW doesn't even acknowledge a problem even though timing chain tensioner has been redesigned. So we have a lot going on there, Joe. Um, let's talk about the redesign thing first. Just because there's a redesign doesn't necessarily mean there's a global problem with this part. It could be lack of uh, part availability. It could be change in vendor, and that requires a, a, a revision. So just because there's a new updated part or a new revision doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem with the old one, but it, in this case, could. Um, the other one, why don't they have an interval? Uh, I don't have the answer to that. Why don't they have a recall? I, this doesn't really feel like a recall thing. Typically, recalls are safety-based, not damage-based like this. Uh, will they ever do something in the future? I, I don't know. I can't make that guess. I've gotten in trouble for trying to make that guess before so my answer is i really don't know so let's focus on the thing that i can tell you about the chain and the tensioner and failures and what do you replace 70k is one of those borderline mileage if you were at 40k i would say eh, just put the tensioner on it you'll probably be fine if you were at 100k i'd say dude you got 100k put the chain on it and put the new tensioner on it you'll need a cover and a couple other little knick-knacky things bolts and whatnot um, in order to do that job. In fact, ShopDap has the whole kit with the tools and everything if you want to DIY that yourself. That is not a DIY job for everyone though. You're, so you're right in the middle. <laughs> you're right in the middle. Uh, God, man, if this were me, I would put a chain on it. You know, it, it's extra work. It's gonna cost you a bit of extra money. But now you know you don't have a problem with the chain stretching. So it's your call, right? It's, it's up to you. Think of it as a timing belt interval. Think of it as, you know, if this car had a belt on it, it would be about seven years old. We'd be looking at changing the belt anyway, even though you only have 70,000 miles. So my gut says, and, and that gut mileage is getting lower and lower. Uh, my gut says, do the chain, do the cover, do the tensioner. Look at Shop DAP. I'll try and put a link down in the description for you to check out his kit so you can kind of see all the stuff that I'm talking about. So I think I'm going to just make that as my recommendation. As far as dealerships not, you know, having any guidance on this, this is a really tough thing for us to give guidance on because if we say, hey, every one of these tensioners fail, so you need to replace it like a timing belt, well, one, now we're saying something different that the salesman told the customer when they bought the car, and two, someone said that to me, I'd be like, well, shouldn't Volkswagen pay for that if they know they have a problem? So we're stuck there. Also, if we say nothing is wrong, we are clearly not telling the truth either because generally someone comes to us with that question because they've read or seen one of my videos about these failures. So you'll find that this question gets answered in kind of a weird, wishy-washy, we don't want to be liable, we don't want to throw Volkswagen under the bus, but we don't want you to be mad at us kind of way. So, man, err on the side, put the chain on it. You won't have to worry in a year, did I make the right choice or did I make the wrong choice and try and save a few bucks, end up having a chain stretch issue, and now we're going back in and doing the same job again. All right, last one comes from Ray, AC line replacement on my 07 GTI. Hey Charles, about the ask a question about the procedure for replacing the AC line going from the condenser, which is at the front of the car, to the evaporator, which is what is basically inside the cabin of the vehicle on the AC system, on a 2007 GTI FSI engine with the turbo. I believe this is a high pressure line, the smaller of the two. So, this line goes from the front of the car, wraps around, up the frame, down and around, behind the engine, over by the thing, up to there, over to here, and it's a pain in the butt to replace. You're gonna have to take the engine mount out, so you're gonna have to support the engine, I don't think you have to take the front end off of the car, but it's been a while since I've done one and, and all the models are just a slight touch different. But this is this hose is like a big U and it's a solid piece, so you can't just like bend it and twist it and install it. I wanna say you're gonna have to take the boost pipe out on that passenger side. And then, you know, it's, it's just a matter of wiggling the hose out and wiggling the hose back in. It's not hard, 
but it is a pain in the butt. And I know that doesn't quite gel together, but it, it's just, you gotta take off more than you really think you should have to in order to replace that part. And this guy won't be one to disagree with that. Uh, we've replaced these lines a handful of times, and every time someone get one, it's like, ugh, not this again. You have to take that engine mount out. You have to, you know, jack the engine up a little bit one way or another, or drop it down a little bit in order to fit that pipe and fit that hose and, and make it work. So, Ray, I wish I had a, a better solution for you, and it was just, you know, if you take this four bolts out three turns, you can slide it right past. Unfortunately, that's not the case. That is the crappiest line to have a problem with because of the way it goes and the way you have to route it. Uh, it's just, it's no fun, but it's doable. Leave yourself plenty of time and just make sure that it goes back in and make sure you don't like stress on the hose too much because those are pretty soft and it's easy to kink. I'd hate for you to get it all the way in and end up having a kinked hose and then have to do it a second time by another hose again. That, that is about the only thing that would make that job worse than having to do it the first time. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do. Hey, if you like this video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe right here on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. When my face pops up in the little circle, hit that, that's the subscribe button. You can also join the crew membership program if you want exclusive discounts you can't get anywhere else, as well as special content from me and VW Audi training guides and more coming soon. Smash that link down in the description that says crew member benefits. Love to have you part of the show over there. All right, guys. Hey, don't forget you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course on Snapchat. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Drink of the day is water because now I'm lame and I don't really drink anymore.